Thank you for joining us today for the Navigating COVID-19 with Navalon and Golder Digital Solutions. My name is Josh Flores. I'll be your moderator today. Brief intro about myself. I am the Global Sales Leader for Digital Solutions and I'm located in Houston, Texas. Uh, before we get started, we're going to go through a few housekeeping items I'd like to make you aware of. Next slide, please. Uh, your microphone has been muted. Uh, please use the question window to submit comments and any inquiries we will try to address the last 15 minutes of the call. And last but not least, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available upon request. Now, I know there are a lot of familiar names online today, but there are a few here that may not know who Golder and or Enablon are. So I'm gonna take a few brief moments here to describe a brief overview of each company. Founded in 1960, Golder is comprised of 7,500 employees across 155 offices worldwide. It is a consulting design and construction company that offers your core services in the environmental and engineering realms. You know, these include remediation, water, waste, and of course, digital solutions. Uh, the digital solutions group is comprised of trained and experienced professionals that provide a wide realm of consulting services. Uh, we partner with over 15 different firms in the software space that range from EHS, quality, sustainability, and risk. One of those top partnerships that we value is Enablon. Enablon is a Walters Kluwer's business and is considered the world's leader in EHS sustainability and risk software. It's comprised of more than 600 people and across over a dozen locations and is considered a very highly configurable system and is also valued at the corporate level down to the site operations. Now, some of the key offerings include environmental sustainability, health and safety, operational risk management, product stewardship, and regulatory compliance. So when you add the Golder team members and the Enablon partnership, uh, they've been working together for more than a decade. Uh, they deliver these projects to clients. And so whenever the COVID-19 took precedence a few months ago, both Enablon and Golder came together to try to put together some tools to help manage the crisis. And that's what brought us here today. So we have some challenges among us. And so that's what we're gonna to try to address. Next slide, thank you. And when this whole thing began, you know, there was these questions that we were asking ourselves like every day. Some things that included the underlying meanings of these include social distancing in relation to inefficiencies and slowdown of work, um, staff reductions, uh, workload variability, whether that be increased or decreased. Um, this could be deemed essential or non-essential. All these moving parts led to limitations in strapping down things like supply chain. And then the overall umbrella of this, you know, was managing the jurisdiction of guidances between the WHO, the CDC, and things like that. So a lot of things are moving, but it's really a simplistic addition. And that's our mantra for today. So what we plan to discuss here is how simple additions can be used to help mitigate the management of COVID-19. So before we get started, I'd like to introduce some team members of ours. Uh, the first is Mr. Dan Sackerson. He is the technical manager of the Digital Solutions Group, and he also happens to be an associate of Golder. Uh, he's been working with the Enable on platform for over a decade, I believe, Dan, and is very familiar with its functionality that it represents. Alongside him is Ms. Noelle Harvey. Uh, this young lady is the Senior Director of Product at Enablon. Uh, she's considered one of the key team members when it comes to the roadmap of the platform. Uh, as it pertains to today's discussion, she's also one of the key members in the instrumentation of the COVID-19 tools that are made available. So without further ado, Ms. Harvey, I turn it over to you. That's great, thank you. And hopefully you're hearing me okay today. Great. So if we um, take a look, we've got a lot of really great tips and challenges that we want to share with you today. So one of the first things, um, and it's first and foremost uh, in all of our minds, is around how do we really keep our people safe and how do we manage this when return to work, back to office and back to operations is such a key challenge that we have to manage across quite often very large uh, global organisations and also against a backdrop of ever-shifting uh, external requirements that Josh referred to earlier. So 
So one of the things that we know is really key is, is going to be able to do some simple checks on our sites and operations. We know the importance of personal protective equipment. How do we ensure the supply of personal protective equipment? How do we ensure the training of it? How do we know that it's being used properly? Um, and how do we also understand where any new cases might spring from? So where might certain work areas um, or certain parts and operations in our business be, be more likely to have exposure to a, a COVID related case or perhaps a, a trigger that might lead to COVID related cases emerging in the business? So Dan, what are we gonna talk about today to kind of address those challenges? Yeah, so hopefully everyone can hear me just fine. Um, so we are here to talk about just some simple additions to the Enable On system uh, to help everyone manage kind of the, the new data that's that's being needed out there. So it's a combination of just simple data additions that everyone can do, you know, general administrators can do, as well as a little bit more complex uh, configuration type aspects uh, that you can add to the system. And then you can go a step further and, and build in even more complex automations on top of that. So kind of later on, we're gonna go through a demonstration of what your peers are doing and just the different levels of complexity, most of which are pretty darn simple uh, to manage this kind, of, uh, this kind of data. All right, so if we go to the next slide then, um, what we also know is that, um, and nearly every day we're hearing about this, we've got new requirements. <clears throat> These requirements are being forced upon us from many different angles at the moment. So we've got our own challenges where we need to be internally uh, rolling out new policies, rolling out new procedures. We need to be able to do that quickly and timely in a timely manner. We have got the Centre for Disease Control and we've got the World Health Organization also looking at um, recommending certain procedures that should be in place if we are bringing workers back into a kind of a new working environment. And what we're also seeing at scale are the amount of executive orders that are coming out. So even at the moment, um, it's very much a headache for, again, global organizations to manage. How do you um, adapt to a recommended global approach to managing a policy or procedure versus being told that at different state levels there are multiple different executive orders coming from governors each detailing to a different level of granularity what should be done regarding um, individuals work uh, individual safety individual uh, hygiene and reporting at different sites so it's a real mishmash of changing information um, that has to be managed right now so what are the, some of the, the solutions that we're going to look at in detail today to help kind of keep us keep us on top of some of these ever-changing issues? Yep, so hopefully you'll be updating your policies and procedures and Enableon has a wonderful array of applications to handle that. So from document control, uh, managing the process of, of what you know, people should be doing and creating these documents and the approvals behind them over into the compliance application where you can take those newly created policies and break them down into actionable elements as well as the audit application is once all of those things have been developed and put in place, having the ability to audit each of those different aspects to ensure that your business is actually carrying out those activities and, and maintaining compliance and maintaining the new kind of norm that we're moving into as well as just that previous topic that you explained um you know just the the kind of confusion or or, or not really a, a well-defined approach when it comes to regulations and and what you should be doing around data separation and data sensitivity and kind of how you mm -hmm. should be managing these things um, there's not been a whole lot of directive around it because we're kind of in this evolving situation. So there are some configuration aspects that you can take uh, to keep that information separate so that once we actually do get some guidelines and some, some advice, we can more appropriately uh, manage that information going forward. So we'll walk through that in the demo as well. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, especially on that last one around incident data capture. So we know that OSHA have had a, a varying different approaches and 
uh, have taken different positions on this um, in the, the past couple of months, but we know that in the last couple of days they have said, well, look, any um, COVID-related illnesses that are reported, we want to treat them like we were treating any other worker-related illness uh, prior to some of the intermediate guidance that OSHA was giving. So for them, it's about um, capturing the detail, but what is the extra data that we need to capture around a particular um, COVID-19 suspected illness or, or confirmed case? Um, and, and how do we make sure that we're, we're capturing that for those particular events? That's what we will look at later on. So very pertinent right now. All right, so if we move on to the next one, um, assuming that we've been able to really understand what to do at each of our sites and facilities to keep our people safe and make sure they've got the right um, supplies of, of PPE. We've got our um, injury and illness reporting uh, uh, requirements in order. We know what we're doing from a policies and procedures approach and we've been able to roll that out and roll that out across our many different sites. What can we now do in terms of monitoring operations? And we know in discussions with our customers that out of any of the programs that our customers are running right now, this is the one that leadership are really scrutinizing. They're really looking for daily updates on. They want answers and they want to be able to um, really predict where um, extra facilities uh, would require maybe additional resourcing, which sites in the business might become um, you know, a, a problem area if we were to experience a lot of people being off. And so the ability to do a check, get some very critical data points at a regular basis and be able to convert that into meaningful data in dashboards that can be rolled up and shared with executive teams is something that um, our customers are, are spending um, a lot of their, their time on right now, just making sure that they've got the right processes in place for that. So you're going to show us some of that today as well, Dan. Yep. Absolutely. And that's that's kind of sort of the, the big thought that's on everyone's minds right now is, well, what do we do next and how how do we get visibility into our operations? How do we know the overall health of our business, um, our people, as well as our supply chain, um, our ability to deliver our product, et cetera, et cetera. So um, good news is there's a number of applications and reporting capabilities within the Enable On solution and some simple enhancements that you can add in to manage this kind of information. So um, it's all around getting visibility into your operations as well as being more informed to maintain business continuity. So business continuity is kind of one of the, the bigger topics that I've been asked about from all of our different clients. So okay, great. We have we have these incidents, we have uh, you know business is being locked down, some different areas that people can't enter. Uh, how do I get this visibility to actually continue our, our daily daily lives? So that's something that we'll go into here. So, All right. Well, shall we get into it? And, and yeah, you're going to take us through a demo right now. Yep. I'm actually going to jump into the Enable On system here. I'm going to bring that up. All right. Can you confirm you can see it? Yep. All right, fantastic. So you can see up top, I have a bunch of different tabs. So these are all the different topics we're gonna go through. Uh, the first one is kind of the, the starting point. So being able to track COVID related incidents or just events in general. Um, so what we've been asked to do for several of our clients is, is something pretty simple. And then I can kind of jump into the more complex things as we go. So the first thing is simply adding a new event type. You can see here in the, the event screen that we have a new event type of potential COVID-19 exposure. Uh, all the other information is pretty much the same. You know, when is this event being logged? And then some uh, details around this type of event. Then things get a little bit more exciting. So when you have uh, that new event type selected, then you can have a new section pop up around just COVID related data in general. So is this COVID related? Yes. Uh, why is it COVID related? Did somebody travel to an impacted area? Is somebody in quarantine? Was somebody tested? If they were tested, what was the result? Was it positive, negative? And then we've had the request to add in another one of, of pending. And then as well as the, the result date. This one's a little bit scary. I 
actually didn't really want to add this one in just because it's so very negative. Unfortunately, it's the reality we live in. Um, but if the person is deceased, then uh, being able to track that kind of information. As well as this part. So this one's pretty important and one that I do see kind of overlooked, but did that employee return to work at some point? Did they enter a work area? If yes, then that could be an indication of potential contamination. So this one right now is just a just an example. It's just a free text entry, but you could get a little bit more complex by making this kind of a link to your location structure or your 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 um, facility uh, hierarchy. But for right now, this is just an example of saying, okay, yes, somebody did return to work and they entered the front lobby. Maybe they were denied entry because they they failed their temperature test for that day. We'll get into that later. Um, but if, if, if you had this kind of information on hand, you can say what areas are contaminated. And then you can build some automation on top of this. So all of these fields, these are simple configurations, right? I mean, they're just really easy fields that you could create yourself if you have form factory. If you don't have for that form factory, um, you know, Nablon can create these for you or, or us at Golder can definitely create this for you. Um, but then we get into kind of more complex stuff. So if somebody did enter a work area and they said that the potential area of contamination, you could have a warning message that states, once verified, an action plan will automatically be created uh, to initiate closure or cleaning activities at the location noted above. So this would be like an on-screen notification as well as some functionality behind the scenes. So once this event is submitted and validated, verified, then it could initiate that automation to do some other activities. And we'll kind of follow the, the chain of, of, of action here as we go along in this presentation. So pretty simple configuration up top of adding a new event type, a little bit more you know, easy configuration just by adding some simple fields and then on into the complex stuff of building in some automation is, is there. And then we get into the topic of, okay, well, these are new fields that are being added to the event form. What if we don't want this information available on the event form? We've had a request from uh, several clients to keep this information completely separate, but still track it in the Enable On system. So in those cases, we built a completely separate table to manage this information, and it looks pretty much the same as this. But the idea there is, since we don't know uh, the guidelines on how this data will eventually be managed or uh, regulated, some companies are kind of taking the, the, the preactive step of just keeping it separate from the beginning until further information, further directive is, is, is announced. So that, is a more complex configuration, but it's still in the realm of not that bad. It's pretty pretty simple. And and just because somebody would keep decide to keep those events separate and maybe just segregate them from some of the other incident types that they're managing, that doesn't mean they lose any of the reporting capability or the analysis capability on there. It, it's still there for them. Yep. And and really those cases for. Uh, having them separate is really just having more control over it and making sure that it's more locked down, more secure, um, and just held completely, completely separate. So um, I would say about half the clients go that way and the other half just say, let's just mm -hmm. create it in the event module and, and, and manage it as, as we are with other events because there's already a bunch of security built in. So. Okay. And um, I think there was a, a question on, on mobile as well. You know, some of this could be made very easily available for um, any employees to kind of self-report um, using the Enable on Go app as well. So, and the, again, how much of those fields you make available on that kind of first report through the mobile app, again, you can very easily control what fields are there and then what fields should be filled out at a later stage by the by the person asking the right questions and um, administering the rest of the event. Absolutely. Yep. And we'll get more into the mobile stuff uh, here, I think, in a couple tabs. 
Um, so essentially, uh, that's one beginning point for some information uh, and some simple enhancements that can be made, as well as kind of jumping into the next topic, which is industrial hygiene. So if you do have an area that is that has suspect contamination, you could create a, a an industrial hygiene risk assessment record using the industrial hygiene module. So this is just an example of that, just some simple information, some simple fields that are added. Um, so these are some new fields. So is it COVID-19 related? And why are you conducting this industrial hygiene assessment? Just gives you a little bit of context as to why. Um, so then you can say, well, somebody traveled to an impacted area or somebody is in quarantine or somebody tested positive. That's the reason behind this uh, risk assessment. And then you can jump into the other things from around industrial hygiene. So uh, what are you observing? What, what uh, similar exposure group, uh, what people are you observing? So, you know, office workers, you're observing for COVID-19 and then the routes of exposure is it uh, skin lung inhal inhalation? And then you can kind of go through your, your risk assessment here. So uh, severity was high and exposure was medium or maybe low and you had a low uh, duration, but the criticality is, is still high because we all know COVID is a very, very serious thing. So this area is all data. So your administrators could easily create mm -hmm. these new aspects, you know, the office worker, I'm assuming that's already an exposure group that you have in your system, but creating a new um, a new agent within your industrial hygiene agent library of COVID-19, and then using the, the different routes of exposure here. Um, so those are some administrative enhancements that you guys can do, and then some simple, very, very simple field enhancements that you can do to track this new information. And then again, it, it kind of gives you a chance by by tracking it in industrial hygiene, it gives you a chance to really show that you're you're focusing on a specific exposure area. So whether that's a, a similar exposure group or whether it's a work area, um, it shows that you've analyzed those, you've documented where you think those higher risks are, and you've conducted the, the proper uh, exposure assessment and then specified which controls should be in place to help manage that. So again, it's a it's a way of and documenting the, the processes that you're doing in place and, and putting in place to pre um, empt any possible contamination, but it's also something that you could put in place to demonstrate, okay, well, here's how we took action. Here's how we followed up when we knew that we had a particular COVID case at one of our sites. Yeah, and that'll be especially um, wonderful when we actually get some new uh, guidance coming from, from regulators, because I'm assuming at some point they'll, they'll Want to have some proof that people are actually following up on on these potential or suspect uh, COVID cases, and this would be perfect evidence for that. Okay, we saw that there was a submitted case or potential case, and then we followed up by doing this uh, risk assessment and, and work area assessment. So, awesome. Uh, the next thing is in the behavioral based safety module. So, this this is all around just simple administrative updates. So the standard BBS module, nothing has been changed up above. Uh, really the only thing that was added was a new checklist uh, by their administrators. So this is just an example of what other clients are using. Uh, it's just a simple uh, new, new behaviors that people are gonna be assessing, a new type of BBS uh, observation that people will be conducting. Uh, something so simple as, you know, do people have PPE? Are they using PPE? I like this next question of, are they using it correctly? Yeah, they might have PPE, but are they wearing the mask on the side or on top of their head rather than in the correct spot? These are very, very important points to understand whether or not people are actually behaving correctly um, to, to mitigate as much as possible. Things like are they washing their hands? Great. Sure, they're washing their hands, or, but are they just rinsing it with water, no soap, and then just kind of shaking their hands, or are they actually using the proper hand washing technique for their correct duration, et cetera, as well as are they maintaining social distance? Um, these are all very key behavioral things, things that you can improve upon and just to help your employees conduct work in a safe manner. And then kind of going along the, the lines that you brought up earlier, Noel. Uh, mobility. So being able to use 
the mobile app. And I think I gave an example here. So mm -hmm. that's the, the BBS checklist in, in, on the mobile device. So you don't have to go to the office to type this up. You can just be out in the field and then create a new uh, observation, enter the different behaviors that you're gonna be observing and then how many people are going to be either safe or not conducting their work in a safe manner. This is all gonna be very important going forward, being able to have this information fed into the system and having the visibility of that the overall health of your organization is gonna be very critical going forward just from a business continuity perspective. And also, I think the just a couple of observations on, on observations in BBS right now, I think as well, uh, the content of this checklist, um, we've already made some initial content available for um, our, our COVID response solutions. But what we're also seeing in the guidance is, you know, social distancing maintained. Different states, for example, in the US are, are taking different approaches to how specific they want physical distancing to be maintained. Um, on particular work sites. So within the platform, it's entirely possible to have different versions of this um, observation checklist available and applicable to certain locations and sites in the business. So you can really tailor, as, as this information comes out, you can really tailor those observations um, uh, to the physical site and where it's based. Um, and the other, uh, I think, key point here is that it really helps in some locations or sites or facilities where they may not really have great connectivity. The, the app allows you to do those observations and record the data when you're offline, and then it can just sync again when it gets um, either a, a, a Wi-Fi connection or a, a cellular connection again. So it really does, it's, it's a very simple tool, very simple approach, but it can be very effective in a very short space of time to help you achieve what you need. Yep, absolutely. And then kind of going along the lines of just uh, simple data enhancements. Uh, so you could also use the inspection uh, module within Enableon to do similar things. So uh, being able to track your other different, your other aspects of the system. So are people appropriately trained? Do they have uh, appropriate PPE? Are the notice boards updated with uh, new policies, new procedures, et cetera, et cetera. So outside of just the behavioral aspect, this is more around the operational aspect and uh, people being prepared enough and mm -hmm. equipped uh, to, to conduct their work in a safe manner. So this is just another example of a, a simple data load that your administrator can do. This is just another checklist that can be loaded and then uh, use that same mobile app instead of uh, doing this in the system is another option. And we're seeing customers frequently using this. So they say we're using it, um, I guess, for an immediate response. You know, how are, how are we dealing with things on site? Um, and, you know, where where are the kind of non-conformances and where are the actions required on individual sites and getting those flagged up through inspections. We're now seeing a bit of a shift where customers are saying, right, we know that there are certain guidelines for preparing to go back to work. How can we get this out quickly to our sites with a real tangible um, Kind of easy to achieve things that each site needs to do to prepare for workers coming back to site let's set this up by an inspection and let's check on an ongoing basis that that the, the progress is good you know that they, these um items are being completed then once the the prep is done and people are then back to work your inspection checklist may become more of a a, a regular inspection on a process or procedure but behavior-based safety and the observations are those really quick checks. You know, tell me, is this being effective? Am I seeing the behavior changes? Am I seeing the safe conditions that I'm looking for on sites? And a really quick and easy check that allows somebody carrying those out to have a good conversation with the people around them. You know, oh, hey, I noticed that we aren't doing the, the right approach to hand washing. As a reminder, here's what we need to do. And it, it, it provides that kind of more conversational approach. Um, an engagement approach with individuals on site on nearly a, a daily basis. So there's some distinctions there with how you could uh, leverage each uh, each checklist approach. Yeah, and you mentioned coming back to work. So that's sort of the, the next topic here, well, sort of kind of going into that next topic of um, how do you manage your mitigation plans or your updated procedures? So. This is just an example of the document control module with an Enableon. So 
here at Golder, we updated our, our COVID-19 mitigation plan and return to work plan. So uh, this is just an example of where we would put it and then kind of the approval process and the management of that approval process and then ultimately where it's housed. So this is just an idea of, okay, well, we have this new operation, this new procedure. Here's the published copy that everyone is available to see and click and download and then quickly uh, open onto their computer and then see the new updated policy and procedure. So this would be something that you would send out to your different facilities. Uh, the managers would post or, or go through and kind of explain the new policies and procedures to uh, the people at those different facilities, as well as managing the distribution of that policy and procedure and the ultimate actions that come out of it. So the document control module can link over to the compliance module, which manages all of that stuff. So here's that same policy that's linked up and we can break it down into the different sections and the different requirements, as well as the tasks that would need to be sent out to all the different facilities uh, and carry out those new updated actions as, as directed by the, by the company in that new procedure. So, um, in addition to these new policies and procedures, having the ability to audit and make sure that people are conducting these things uh, in the, uh, these new actions in an appropriate manner, as well as uh, kind of making sure that everyone's informed of that. So this is just an example of a new question uh, questionnaire list for your different auditors that can be added into their audit regimen. So are they in, people are they in kind of making sure that their response plan is developed as well as ensuring that prevention measures are in place, et cetera, et cetera. So just imagine this is a new questionnaire that's given to your auditors so they can conduct um, kind of like this updated audit procedure in relation to those new policies, those new regulations that are hopefully gonna be sent out here soon. And uh, I think one of the challenges that we're we're having right now is we're getting a lot of questions around, you know, how do we conduct virtual audits? You know, it's, it's the the fact that you can't have so many people going out onto sites doing their doing their 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 tours of a state or a particular geographic region, being on site and effectively um, auditing. Uh, procedures in person. So the fact that um, something like this could be set up in the audit module, there are different approaches you could take to having the, the self-assessment open for a period of time, who you would give access to that self-assessment, you know, asking for a majority of information to be kind of self-reported by the individual site, adding links or showing where some of that information is held virtually, um, and allowing the site themselves to upload as much of that evidence in advance before an auditor could come in then and, and take a look at it. So there's different uh, approaches to how long you could leave the audit open for, who you could give access to it, and um, it, could, it could very easily be adapted for a more kind of virtual uh, approach. Yep, that's, that's a really great point because uh, that's something that's definitely been brought up as a need from many different clients as well. How do we, how do we maintain this compliance going forward when we can't have people enter the sites because it's locked down? So the, having the ability to self-assess and upload that information and then really have auditor come through as a verification step and say, okay, yes, this is in place. Yes, there's a picture of uh, the billboard or, or not the billboard, but the, you know, the uh, work area boards that show that the new procedures posted, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's ways to kind of make sure that that stuff is actually done because you know the site personnel can send pictures, but you could also use, if you have like video cameras there, you can use that as a way to inspect the areas. I know some other clients are getting a little bit more sophisticated and they'll have drones or robots that go around with, with video ca uh, capture capability to do those audits. Um, it's just a whole array of, of, of options there, but yeah, being able to remotely audit is gonna be more and more important, I think, as we go forward. Yeah. And I, I, I suppose as a follow up to that, if that's a, a new type of procedure or approach that you're re recommending to people on site and um, the ability for somebody who is site based to be able to take the audit app and to capture some of the evidence, 
using um, an iPad that again could be offline, but they would be in situ, that one person who is allowed to be in the facility could be in situ, they could be taking pictures or recordings and linking them to the right questions in the self-assessment, which would then be visible by an auditor somewhere else. So there's a couple of different solutions to, to deal with this uh, new, new approach going forward. So then we get into the data aspect and just kind of being able to compile it all into one spot. So the metrics application with Enable on has been around for a very long time. People have used it for all different types of data management for, for environmental health safety uh, data aspects. But really this application can manage almost any kind of data. So if you don't have a, a system to manage COVID related data, this might be a really good option for you. I know Enableon has sent out some new questionnaires that you can download. This you know, is an example of one of them uh, to send out to your different facilities, have them key in the response to each one of these questions and these data aspects. But you can also go in a, a step further. So there's an automation, I know some of you might know this, um, but there is a way to pull information from all over the Enable On system and put it in one spot, which is going to be really important going forward uh, to be able to look at your data holistically. So uh, the MTQ or business analyzer template, real, whatever you want to call it, it's just an automation. It's just a doorway to be able to pull information from events or behavior based safety or your inspections or audits or whatever, whatever part of the system you want, pull it into one spot and you can have things like this, which are calculated, they call calculated indicators um, to automate all of that data collection and then have the results shown. So if you want to see the total track number of employees, uh, confirmed cases, who's in quarantine site by site, this is an option that you could use. I know Enableon has some questionnaires and some already uh, created templates that you can utilize uh, for this, but you can go a step further as well and build even more complex indicators and, and really get the uh, kind of highlighting the business continuity aspect so you can actually build some really cool dashboards. I'm gonna show you just a really simplified dashboard here that some of this data feeds into. So this is just a COVID specific dashboard. So if you have incidents or suspected areas of contamination, you could have a report that is sourced from incident management or metrics or BBS or whatever part of the system, then you can have it compiled in one spot and then analyzed and then basically simplified down into potential area of contamination at this facility, at this room. You can track all of your events and then overall see the trend of it. So in March, there weren't very many uh, COVID related events. And then April, we're all in lockdown. Nobody was at work. So there was basically no events. But now we're coming back to work in May and our events are going up. Why are they going up? Well, maybe it's due to behaviors. So looking at the behavioral aspects of it, um, you know, PPE usage techniques was not that great. So there was a lot of people at risk in March. People are getting better in April and are even better uh, in May, but maybe social distancing. Oh, look at this. So it was terrible in March. It was better in April because we weren't at work. But now that we're going back to work, it's starting to go back up. So we're able to kind of highlight trends using the different reporting capabilities. And then getting into metrics, if you have some really sophisticated uh, uh, calculated indicators, you can have a number of data attributes analyzed and then just really simplified down to, is there a potential impact to the Chicago site or the Detroit site or the Atlanta site this month or the way things are trending, maybe not this month, but in three months, the Houston site might be at risk, uh, you know, the supply chain or just the general operations might be at risk. So you can have a report that's updated in real time and simplified saying, okay, this facility is going to have some issues. And then you can just right click on it and then go into the data behind the scenes as to why, uh, you know, this information is, or why this facility is flagged. So 
really simple dashboard that you guys can do, that you can create. Um, I know we can also uh, export these kinds of dashboards and then provide that out to people so they can import them. Um, there probably will be some differences in the data structure, so it will depend on kind of like what indicators you guys are using, but um, that's another thing that could be supplied out there. It's just an example dashboard for people. So um, really the main idea here is to have a lot of complex data behind the scenes, but really simplify it for, for operations. So when somebody goes into the system, they can easily go, okay, today there's a new potential area of, of contamination. We need to go do some decon procedures over in lab room 13 or oh no uh, it looks like the detroit site is is not going to be doing so well uh, from a business continuity perspective this month um we need to start putting in some you know, corrective actions to to mitigate that so and I think one of the one of the key things we're, we're seeing in, in customers at the moment is the the desire from additional members of quite senior and executive leadership teams to have access to um, real time data on what's happening in the business. Um, and so one of the one of the really quick things that can be configured is to create a really clean, simple dashboard that would be um, ready for consumption by executives and simply have that um, going out, um, being emailed from the Enable On platform mm -hmm. to the um, email address of, of whoever within the leadership team needs to have that. So it's just one way that they could have a weekly update. The um, report would arrive into their uh, inbox on a, on a regular basis. And then it's just helping you to show that you're being proactive. You're trying to get the data out there. And then any weekly um, meetings are, are better used to manage the exceptions. You know, what, what do we really need to focus on here? And that's just a really simple thing. It's, it's, it's um, a feature that's always been available in the platform, but maybe think about how we could use that for a wider group of people. The other thing um, about keeping uh, leadership uh, in tune with what's happening in operations as well is to um, perhaps use workflow in a slightly different way um, on, on some of the, the data that's being recorded. So we've, we've seen asks <laughs> from very senior people uh, on management teams to be sent an email when their specific trigger is uh, exceeded on any type of data in the Enable On platform. Now, you as a, an EHS and ops management team can really think about whether you want that to happen or not, but the capability is there in the platform and um, to uh, just a allow senior members to have access or to get updated from the platform where they may not have had such updates before. Yep. Well, that's it for the demo, but that's essentially managing the today situation and then being able to get visibility into your business health. So when people do come back to work, you'll, you'll be a little bit more informed on areas of improvement and mitigating activities. But really the situation is we are all gonna be returning to work. We're doing it here at Golder. I know our clients are doing it around the world as well. Um, so there's, some, there's gonna be some things to keep in mind. So we're all gonna be adjusting to this new norm. Uh, so you should be thinking about how to manage this. And it's gonna be a little weird, you know, um, but there are some things that you can do to prepare and there should be some things that you should be thinking about. So will you be tracking this new type of data? Will you be auditing? Um, what are you doing from a business continuity perspective? What plans do you have in place? And uh, how are you going to be keeping data separate or are you going to be keeping data separate? Um, so there are some business planning activities that you should be thinking about now, um, you know, before people are returning to work or in the process of, of people returning to work. Um, things will change. Uh, this is kind of what other people are doing uh, to kind of mitigate some of these things or make it a little bit easier, um, or as well as things you should be thinking about. So analyzing your, your work areas. I know that there was a recent release around just uh, like AC ventilation and the ability to transfer uh, the virus. So I know some people before employees are returning to work, they're looking at the office layout and their ventilation system and moving desks away from the, the vents so that they aren't completely you know, blasted by this potential um, 
you know, virus that might be coming from the, the vent, as well as just adjusting the work area in general. So um, they might have an open floor plan with a bunch of, of, of workstations, making some of those workstations uh, unavailable. So to space out people from one another, you know, a six foot distance as well as going touchless. So installing uh, keyless entry and sensor ent entry, um, kind of going through new procedures to use touchless devices. I'm a germaphobe. I've, I've been paying with my phone at grocery stores for the longest time because uh, I don't like uh, touching the credit card machine. Those that know me know that I'm an absolute germaphobe. I'm really happy seeing other people do this now, but that's just another kind of uh, enhancement to technology or using technology to kind of mitigate as, as, as much as possible. And then speaking about technology, here are some things that other uh, people are doing. So integrating temperature monitoring systems with badging systems or, or entry systems. So uh, we've had some clients state that they are requiring uh, a temperature reading each day that an employee comes to a facility. And if they don't have a valid temperature reading for that day, their badge is deactivated so they cannot enter the building. Uh, or if they get a temperature reading and it's outside the acceptable range, then again, their badge is deactivated, can't enter the building. Uh, some other clients are relying upon mobile apps. So having all of their employees install a social distancing app. So basically it beeps and set, you know, signals that you are too close to another employee. I know everyone's going, well, that can't, can't be that accurate, but there are some uh, enhancements, some hardware that you can install in your facilities to kind of amplify the accuracy of uh, the GPS location of your phones, um, as well as the capability of contact tracing. So if somebody is sick or, or gets uh, 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 tested and they're positive, they can trace back who they came in contact with and inform them that they should go into quarantine because somebody else uh, was sick that they were in contact with. And then there's something even cooler that Enablon is doing. It's in proof of concept. It's called Enablon Sense, and Noel is going to talk a little bit more about that. All right. So um, we work a lot with customers who are obviously, uh, again, managing lots, uh, large numbers of employees, large number of contractors, and have a large number of, of sites that they need to manage as well. So um, our data science and, and data engineering team have been looking at ways that machine learning and artificial intelligence could be applied to a situation like uh, returning to work and, and how could it really help in operations. So one of the things that we're, we're currently trialing is um, the use of machine learning applied to video footage from sites. So if we go to the next slide, um, we know that uh, almost at any site we've got CCTV cameras that are, are running. Um, and these CCTV are normally recording 24 hours a day. It's all done automatically. A lot of them are um, IP cameras. They're, they're connected to uh, a network internally. And um, we've done a proof of concept on this where we're looking at this case as a pedestrianized zone, but we're able to run the processing on the video footage coming in and um, track and see our physical distancing guidelines being met or not. So anybody that's kind of highlighted in green um, are keeping a safe distance away from other pedestrians. Anyone who's not observing the, the correct distancing is, is kind of highlighted in red. And essentially what you can do with that model is then um, capture an anomaly and choose what sort of data on that anomaly you would like to, to kind of capture or convert into an observation or perhaps an event in um, the Enablon platform. So this is something that's um, a very late stage proof of concept that the technology is there. It's simply applying it instead of, of detecting anomalies around personal protective equipment, for example, we're just applying a new model to looking at physical distancing. And um, it's something that we would love to um, talk to uh, customers about and see if this is something you could use to help make the process of checking whether physical distancing in operations is being successfully um, observed or not. And it's just a really quick way of getting access to some numbers, some leading indicators on what's really happening on your sites. Okay. Awesome. Well, I think the next thing that we have, or the last thing we have is the 
Q&A, and I believe, Josh, you're going to walk us through that. Yes, sir, I will. Thanks, Dan. Um, got a couple of questions out there. Um, let's, uh, let's start off with this one. Uh, what's the difference between using metrics, audits, and checklists for doing control and operation checks on sites? Okay, so this is a good one, Dan. There's many different ways to compare and contrast what they do. Um, so, shall I start with metrics and then we can kind of um, pick up on, on audits and checklists. So, so metrics, one of the ways is w uh, that you can apply metrics is on that um, campaign frequency. So, we can do monthly frequencies and we're going to check if we can do weekly frequency on that as well. I know we've had a, a, a kind of a question on that, but it's a really great way of getting sites, individual sites, to complete a, a, a short or long questionnaire on very different topics at a very uh, regular frequency. And it's just really easy data that that site could input. So you could nominate a particular representative at that site. They, they, they have to complete that particular um, questionnaire on a really regular basis and just enter some key data. There's no additional workflow that sits behind it. They can simply enter the numbers or the, the comments or qualitative data about what my site has done in the last week or in the last month on a particular topic. So it's really great for getting um, focused operational information from those sites. When we look at audits and checklists, I mean, Dan, you, you showed um, audits linked to policy changes. Audits are more about those more, more structural types of data, more programmatic approaches um, to our policies and procedures. And we really need to capture, are we in compliance or are we out of compliance with those? and capture a lot more information around that. So what action plans, what non-conformances am I finding? Looking at trends on non-conformances um, over a, a period of time. And then with inspections, inspections is at more of that operator level. So what are the things I want operational people on site to be checking on a really regular basis? Um, very much operational things around um, kind of structural things being in operation. So things like equipment, things like procedures, do we have the artifacts of those procedures in place on our sites? So there's there's multiple different ways that we can um, kind of use those different tools, dependent on the frequency, dependent on the type of data that we want to collect. I don't know, Dan, would you like to add um, anything else to that? I mean, really, it's just uh, ease of data entry and, and separation yeah. of data are are kind of the critical ones. I know that I've been asked multiple times that BBS versus inspections and uh, really it comes down to ease of data entry and the, the mobile capabilities as well on top of that. Yeah. Um, so one thing that, um, you know, metrics is really good at asking that question um, to a site. So you do have to nominate one person at a site um, who would be going in and, and representing and entering data um, from that site, but but the idea of metrics campaigns is they're not really focused on an individual. They're they're more focused on capturing data that represents a, a site or an entity. Okay. Awesome. So uh, another question is, how do we get new accounts set up on mobile? Um. So I guess uh, that's really just a, a question of, you know, how many how many um, employees or contractors do you want to have and, and give access to the, the mobile apps to? Um, and then it's just a question of checking what your current license covers and then having a conversation with um, uh, Enable on uh, about getting those extra licenses set up. The actual process of getting them set up is, is quite straightforward. Um, you, you simply um, indicate which mobile capability that user should have access to on their account. Um, they need to download the app, get set up on it, and, and then they've got it. It's a pretty easy setup process. Yep. Okay. Uh, can we get a dashboard report templates to import? Uh, yes. So I know Enable and you guys were working on some different dashboards as well as the one that I presented here today. So there is a way, there's an export, kind of a, a configuration export that we could do and deliver to uh, to, to you guys to, to load in, but it would definitely be an administrative set. So uh, depending on your access, you know, the appropriate person would have to load it in. Um, the caveat there is that some of these dashboards are based upon 
um, specific things already being loaded in the system, such as having the correct metrics campaign um, or metrics questionnaire loaded in or the correct BBS questionnaire loaded in because those links are already kind of already predetermined to uh, source that dashboard. Um, as long as those are in place, it's pretty much a, it's a pretty simple entry. So that is something that can be done. So you can either ask us or um, Noel, and then we can work through those, uh, getting getting you guys some dashboards. Okay. A few more questions here. Uh, this next one has to do with metrics. Um, has metrics been modified to allow launching campaigns on greater frequency other than monthly? Uh, you mentioned frequent updates, but monthly campaigns are not frequent enough. Please advise. Yeah, so this one, um... In the majority of customers are doing monthly updates with them. Um, how you would set up and configure it for weekly, that's a, a question we can take away and come back to you with a, a confirmation on. Okay. Uh, next question is, um, how do we determine if COVID-19 is work-related using the Enable on Incident Management application? Is there a decision tree-like set of questions asked? Okay. Yeah. That's a really interesting one. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, let, let me let me give some sort of initial impression and then Dan, yeah, you can talk a bit more. I mean, you showed some of this in the in the demo earlier. OSHA has literally come out with new guidance that says, okay, if you you need to capture the detail of, of the case. And then you need to um, capture information on, on whether this is, the coronavirus illness is work related or not. But it's difficult to do if the employees experienced exposure in or outside of the workplace. How can you determine that? Um, and what OSHA is saying right now is that employers, and I'm just quoting OSHA here, must make reasonable efforts based on evidence to determine whether the worker contracted the illness on the job. So I think there's a whole range of, of questions and the guidance that Dan had shown on the form was great. There are certain key questions that you could ask. Um, you know, when did the symptoms present themselves? Um, when were you last in the workplace? Um, how many people did you come into contact um, recently? You know, to show, look, did I, did the majority of people I came into contact with, were they, was it in the workplace or was it outside of the workplace? Um, so there are a, a couple of, of additional questions that could be answered on there. Um, it's really difficult to, to link it. It's really difficult to, to prove whether or not um, it was contracted outside of the workplace. But I think the key is to, is to be able to add those extra questions in uh, and try and capture that data as, as best you can. I think there are also some questions that you can ask in certain states and certain geographic regions versus others where you, you simply can't ask some of those questions to employees. I've been asked that question as well and really it's it's uh, like you said it's going to be very very tough um, outside of just being able to log an incident or a suspect case where some other employee was positive and you came in contact with that employee or some employee went entered a work area and they were positive and then you worked in the same area etc outside of that it's going to be really really tough and even in those circumstances it doesn't exclude you from it possibly being non-work related because you could have also been positive when you entered that work area with that other positive uh employee so um it'll it'll be tough going for I, I don't really have an answer for that one i it's uh yeah. it'll be tough. But I, I think it highlights the importance of being able to show all of the range of activities that you're doing on site and to be able to show evidence should you need to of what you've been doing. So have we um, got a very good understanding of what's happening on a particular site? Is cleaning and sanitation taking place? Are we reducing the numbers of people? Um, are we showing that we've got good physical distancing? Are we monitoring for any additional exposure assessment? Are we doing regular inspections and observations? So the presence of all of those additional um, factors and activities and being able to demonstrate that they're happening will also be, be, be helpful in trying to answer that question for a particular case. Yep. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we have come to the end of our session today. Uh, Mr. Dan Sackerson, Ms. Noel Harvey, thank you so much. And I thank you for your time. Uh, the remaining questions will be following up with you individually. If you have any other follow-ups, please do not hesitate to reach out to any of us on this call. 
we appreciate your support and we appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.